As Washington, D.C.'s Central Library, the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library serves D.C. residents from every neighborhood and culture in our city, with offerings ranging from makers' labs to town halls. Co-working to concerts, we go well beyond books. Here, artists and activists, teachers and learners, toddlers and seniors converged to explore our city's past and the infinite potential of its future. Because the MLK Library is not only a place to be quiet, it is a place to be heard, to be understood. It is a place to explore the possibility of all we can be. And it is a place to just be. Welcome to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library, celebrating 50 years as Washington, D.C.'s first memorial to Dr. King. At this time, we ask that you silence your cell phones. For tonight's program, the use of recording devices and flash photography is prohibited. And we thank you for keeping your mask on throughout your visit. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah. Happy Friday. I'm Asia Clark, the first floor manager here at MLK Library. And it's wonderful to see so many of you here in person. And thank you um, to many, um, to all those who are online watching. Welcome to our continued Band Books Week series of programming, sponsored by the Institute for Museum and Library Studies, the DC Public Library Foundation, and Mahogany Books. Tonight, each of you will leave with a complimentary copy of All Books Are in Blue immediately following the program. Please join me in thanking um, all of our, um, I'm sorry, Please join with in me in thanking them for their support of tonight's events. Thank you. <clears throat> so tonight is a special one as we welcome back an author whose work has been the focus of way too many banned book campaigns throughout the country. Over the past year, George M. Johnson, who is here, we are so excited. A non-binary -binary activist and author of We Are Not Broken and All Boys Aren't Blue. George serves as the honorary chair of the American Library Association's annual BAM Books Week initiative. We are thrilled they have made DC part of the tour and campaign. Their work joins a list of authors that include Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give, and the nearly 1,600 books being challenged throughout the country, mostly written by and focusing on people of color and the LGBTQT plus community. Guiding us tonight through the conversation is Eugene Scott, national political reporter with the Washington Post. Eugene is a frequent cable news contributor and proud native Washingtonian. Eugene, welcome to MLK Library. In the words of former President Barack Obama, who tweeted today about BAM Books Week, I hope you'll take a moment to appreciate the stories that need to be told. And I hope you'll join me in reminding anyone who will listen, and even those who won't, that the free, robust exchange of ideas has always been at the heart of American democracy. Please welcome George and Eugene. Good evening. Can you all hear us? Can you hear me, Elise? <laughs> it is so good to be here, be yes. here with you, and yes. be here with you all. Uh, as I uh, shared with the organizers, I, um, I remember this, this building as a kid, and uh, it's, it's always great to, um, as you're moving around a city that has changed so much, that has changed so much, um, to see things that have uh, remained not the same, but similar. And this is one of those uh, spots, and so I'm really glad I get to come back here and be with you. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I have a few questions, uh, and I know you all do as well, and so I'm certainly going to give you all an opportunity to uh, ask those, because I can text George whenever I want <laughs> to ask questions, but um, we're so glad, so glad you all are choosing to spend your Friday evening um, with us. Yes. Yeah. 
So my first icebreaker question, um, what are like, not in any particular order, but your three favorite songs on Renaissance? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, what are my three favorite songs on Renaissance? Um, he did is definitely good. in the top three. Church Girl is number one, period. Okay, okay. Um, Church Girl's number one, like period. Okay. Um, he did is definitely in like the top three. And then that third song would be, I'm like going through the songs in my head right now, like, I know everybody, I hear people like, cuff it, it's cuff it. That's one of my favorites. Everybody's like, cuff it, it's cuff it. And I'm like, I don't know, it's cuff it three or four. And I'm like, I don't know. Um, Yeah, cuff it. I think cuff it is three. Yes, you can listen to it again on the way back, so you'll be sure. Yes, I'm like, I think cuff it is three. But definitely heated church girl cuff it. Good, okay, good. But Break My Soul is up there, though. Like, I, so, it ties the album together. Yes. She did something with that. because So, <laughs> Cuff It and Energy are in my top three. I know yes. people don't like energy like I that. Love but energy. It's, it's great. And um, when you say Break My Soul, obviously, Cuff It into Energy into Break My Soul <laughs> yes. is just it's everything. Just genius. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah, that got that out the way. That's a, a, a black and queer question, so yes. it's relevant. <laughs> um, so, I, I just want to know, how, how, are you, how are you doing really? <laughs> Um, how am I doing? You know, it's tough. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest. It's yeah. tough because you write a book and you put like these, your family in this book. Um, and so it's like your family then becomes characters to people in the world. And so it, it was interesting. Like I remember when I, the book first came out and everybody was like, oh my God, this this grandmother, like nanny, like how is she? Like where is she? And I'm like, she had just died right, right before, and like a lot of my friends, Eugene knew, like a lot of my friends yeah. knew she had passed. Um, like well, maybe like four months before the book had came out, and so like I went through like a very interesting mourning period where it was like I have to talk about the most important woman to my family, to my life, to the world, and she's not here, mm -hmm. even though before I wrote this book, I had imagined that she would be here. Yeah. Um, and then the, the, that moment came back full circle again, uh, eight weeks ago, almost to this day, uh, because my older brother, Gigi, passed away, who is the ch chapter 10 about, uh, daddy's second chance. And so, um, I lost my, you know, brother Gigi 10, about eight weeks ago. And so it's an interesting thing that happens because it's like I still one I exist as a public figure mm -hmm. two I still have to show up to all the events all the things I, you know I did Tamron Hall yes I have to I still have to be George um while privately I'm still grieving and mourning and struggling and all of those things but you have to show up the way you have to show up when you are a public figure um what I can say is that I'm okay um, I am blessed and fortunate that I have an altar where I can pray to my ancestors every day at home. Um, one of the things I do when I travel, I bring a picture of my mom, a picture of my grandmother, and a picture of my great-grandmother, Lula Mae, with me. And so if I'm off balance, even when I travel, I just sit them up and put a candle up and I talk to them. So be like, all right, I'm off. Like, just give me some guidance, um, but I'm okay. Yeah. But it's tough yeah. because my story's being banned, we're fighting, and midterm election's coming up, so it's getting even hotter, 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 right? Yeah. Um, never thought I would be the center of attention for yeah. <laughs> about a book. It's, it's interesting because you see, um, you know, I see the headlines, and mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, everybody's talking about George's book, and which is like in theory good, but then you read it, you're like, um, this can't all be comfortable. This is not like what you were thinking. And no matter how, you know, great the photos are <laughs> of you at a book signing or an event, I was like, this has to be like hard. And I don't want to project that on you, yeah. but I, I wanted to, um, I didn't want to assume that your goal was to close Banned Books Week. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, like it was interesting because it was like I always knew my book would be banned. Okay. So 
But I had the meeting. It was in 2019 before COVID changed. So like always, like when you're writing it, you're like, oh, this is going to be banned. Okay. And so like we had the first major meeting at McMillan and Publix is there, this there, like all the teams are there. Like, and they're like, you're one of our lead titles and we want to talk to you. How do you feel? I'm like, well, I was like, well, what do we do? Like if I need security at like events and they were like, why would you need security? And I was like, because this book is going to get banned. No. And I said it like flippantly, and they were like, well, why would you think the book's going to I was like, because I live in America, and I'm black and queer. I know what, to, I, know, I, know what I wrote. I yeah. was about to say the F word. I'm yeah. trying to do. I didn't curse yesterday on Tamron. I'm doing my best That's not good. to curse. Right, That's I'm good. doing my best not to curse here. Yeah. Um, but it was like, I know what I wrote. Like, they're going to ban this. Like, are y'all like, like, they're going to ban this. Mm -hmm. Um, didn't know it was going to look like what it looked like yeah. today, right? So I think that was the thing where it was like, oh, like, I knew the book was going to be banned. I didn't think, like, I would be the second most banned right. book in the United States, yeah. right? Like, it's like, that's a a huge yeah. thing when you like, whoa, like, it's a whole lot of people against me. Um, but I'm also on a list with Toni Morrison, so. Yeah, and, but there are a whole lot of people for So that's you. cute. There are a whole lot of people <laughs> for you. And yes. I mean, which is why we're here right now. Yeah. Uh, just briefly, because um, you mentioned it, and this is for anyone, you're speaking about grieving um, as a public figure. I was listening this morning to Anderson Cooper has a, a podcast called All In, and he's talking about the loss of his mom who died about three years ago, and I don't know how much more uh, his story you know. Uh, yeah. but. Uh, he also lost his uh, brother at an early age and his dad. He's interviewing Stephen Colbert, who lost his dad and two brothers in like a plane accident oh, wow. um, all at the same time. And so they're talking about grieving, um, you know, the, just the constant grieving of people really close to you who shaped you, who helped make you um, uh, while being a public figure. Yeah. And I've read your writing enough, even before uh, you were <laughs> author, when you were a journalist, just, I was just, gonna say just a journalist, but <laughs> yeah. a journalist to know that your grandmother was a very influential person yes. to you. How do you think she shaped you as a writer in particular, your identity as a writer? That's a good question. Um, and it's funny because I do know Anderson Cooper's mother is Gloria Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which a lot of people is like, yeah. like Vanderbilt, like yeah, Vanderbilt like College, other Vanderbilts, <laughs> like the first steamboats yeah. in America were yes. Vanderbilts. Yeah. Um, how did she shape my writing? My God. Um, like, you know, oral tradition mm -hmm. is like a thing in black families. Yes. And when I think about her, I think about the fact that like she didn't graduate from high school. Um, I think she left high school around like ninth grade or tenth grade. Mm -hmm. um, she had my mom when she was sixteen, um, but I just remember her being like one of the best orators mm -hmm. that I had ever encountered. Yeah, she could she could tell a like she could tell a story. Mm -hmm. She could tell a story, mm -hmm. right? Um, and even when I was writing the second book, We Are Not Broken, and my uncle was like, one of the, like, he was like, you know, um, Nanny, that's what I called her, um, was like, it's a sad rabbit that got one hole. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, what's that saying? And she, he was like, she said it because, like, I told her, like, I was dealing drugs, and... <laughs> Um, like my drug business was drying up and he was like, I thought she was going to be like, I can't believe you're dealing drugs and I can't. And he was like, she literally looked at me and was like, it's a sad rabbit that got one hole. Okay. They only got one hole. And he was like, oh, like, she like, I don't care that you dealing. Like, it's like, how, how did you let them stop your whole life? Your whole because that was the only thing you had. She like, I taught you I'm a hustler. Right. I, got, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. And so, like, when I think about her and, like, my storytelling, I think about the fact that, like, she never was, like, that person that just, like, came from, like, a linear place. Mm. She always was that person that came from this place that was, like, abstract. Okay. And so it's, like, my writing is abstract. Mm. Like, I look at the other side of things. I try to find the story within the story. I try to find a story that hasn't been told. Mm. Um, and even like within the book, All Boys Aren't Blue, when you know I was 13 and she said like, you may have to wipe my ass one day. Yeah. 
that like like how beautiful how bold how brave of you to prepare me to take care of you mm. 20 years later mm. like as a 13 year old like you said it flippantly but you said it because you because you knew like mm. How ancestral is that, right? And so it's like, my storytelling is very ancestral because it's like, I'm saying things that right now you may not understand and that people may not understand, but 20, 30 years from now, when some child picks up my book, Hmm. it'll change their life. It'll be the thing that stops them from um, dying by suicide. It'll be the thing that catapults them into being the writer that they want to be, right? And so that's what I've learned from, that's where I got like my writing chops from her. It was the, literally the fact that like she said things that were like very like uh, foreshadowing. Yeah. And it's like, that's what really, what writing is. And yeah. like, I just saw the video of Toni Morrison talking about uh, Beloved. Mm. And she was like, the ghost, like everybody's so afraid of the ghost. She's like, the ghost is the ancestor. And I was yeah. like, you yeah. know, it's like, whoa like when you really hear her she's like i knew this 40 years ago and now we're all reviewing her work later and like having all these newfound opinions she's like i knew that when i wrote it Mm. but i knew it was going to take time for y'all to get it right um and so that's how my grandmother has influenced my writing like i get it and she gets it it may take time for everybody else to get it but they'll get it I wonder if, you know, <laughs> I ask you in 20 years, what are the, there's some things that, I mean, you already get it now, but that you get even more in yeah. 20 years from your own writing that you don't get right now. That'll be an interesting conversation. It will be. <laughs> I, was, I was telling Ryan one thing I wanted to ask you about um, is how has your understanding or, you know, beliefs about boyhood changed since you wrote the book? <laughs> because um, I know, and you could talk about it if you want, but like your own um, like gender identity yeah. uh, has changed since you started writing the book, or you yes. you you, you express use, it differently. Yes, I do. And so I was like, maybe he even views boyhood differently since he views gender differently. Yep. Or I mean, help me with that. Yeah. So I, it's funny because like I say, like my preferred pronouns are they them. But I don't care what people call me. Like Big Frida, I think got us like across the the hill mm-hmm. when um, Slim Thug asked, yeah, yeah. like, "Well, what are your pronouns?" And Frida was like, "Listen, I ain't, I don't know about pronouns, but to these people, I'm this. To these people, I'm yeah. that. And to these people, I'm that." I've always felt that way. Okay. To my fraternity, I am bro. Yeah. yeah. Um, to my like just briefly yes. right after George yes. announced that he was going by he they George and I are in the same fraternity Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity Incorporated yes. which Martin Luther King Jr. was also in okay and um, <laughs> I was like can I still call you brother brother <laughs> right and people literally a lot of them were like can we still call you brother I was like yes like because we fine. don't have a they them in the frat yet right. we got a long way right. we got a long ways yeah. to go but yeah. also it's like you know like it's fine like I understand that like we we live in this world with these gendered pronouns and gender terms and it's like okay it's okay though like Mm -hmm. I get it like it doesn't bother me like I know who I am I wanted the world to know who I was um but the pronouns like whether you call me he she they Mm -hmm. girl Mm -hmm. sis like Mm -hmm. you know like twiggy poochie girl so I'm just my sis and I'm twiggy sis and like we always gonna be sisters right so it's like that type of stuff doesn't bother me okay um I'm like, wait, what was it? Really but yeah, question? I want to. I like, want to know how you view oh, boyhood, the boyhood. For me. So it's like when I think about boyhood, um, I think about Baby G. Baby G. I've posted a lot of, on my social media. That is my brother's uh, child, mm. and uh, this Baby Garrett. <laughs> that we call, but we but we call him Baby G. Um, I think about him, and like mm. I wrote a letter in the book to my brother right when baby g was uh they were pregnant with baby g and i was like you know that was one of my greatest fears was like what if what if baby g turns out to be like me Mm. but what i also said was like i i also don't have fear because if baby g turns out to be someone like me is a father like you that protected a person like me right and so when i think about boyhood now i think about like how we need to shift the narrative like away from like this ideology of like masculinity, yeah. this ideology of 
basketball and football yeah. and being tough and rough. It's like, we just need to allow boys to be. And it's funny mm -hmm. because I was having a conversation with someone today about it. And I was like, you know, because I was watching like one of those morning shows. And I think they had like, it was an Emerald Lagasse or like, it was like one of those like chefs. Oh yeah. And I was like, you know, it's so funny because I was like, Emerald Lagasse, famous chef. Mm -hmm. Uh, buddy that does the cake balls, like famous, you write like all of the top people in that industry are men. And I was like, but if those men said as a five-year-old, I want to bake a cake right. or I want an easy bake oven, right. they would have been shamed for it. Yeah. And so I was like, how do we get to this place where it's like boys have the ability. I know what a conversation came up because there's a boy in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, who's a great dancer. Oh, okay. And my friend is the principal of the school and is trying to work with the mother to get her to understand, like, your yeah. child has this great talent. Like, stop trying to yeah. be against it. Yeah. And so I was like, well, you got to, I was like, show her examples mm -hmm. of, like, what happens when you support a person who's passionate about a thing. Yeah. And, but that, but that was the thing that, like, really sticks with me when I think about boyhood is, like, we will deny boys so many things. Yeah. You can't be a gymnast. You can't be a this. You can't be a cook. You can't be a sh you can't be this or this. Yeah. And then they end up becoming like the greatest thing in the world. But it's like they could have been that or even greater right. had you not denied them access to the thing that they were passionate about. Yeah. And so I just want when I think about boyhood, I'm like, I want the parents of boys to just allow them to be. Right. Allow them to cry. Big boys don't cry. What do you mean big boys don't cry? Right. They definitely cry. Because when they don't cry, then they be mad and then right. they want to punch somebody in their face yeah. and they become violent. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, we, we don't want to allow boys to emote. We don't want to allow boys to like do these things. It's like crying is a natural thing, right? Yeah. So like even like that saying is just like, right? Oh, you the man of the house. That's a five-year-old. Right. Why is this five-year-old right. the man of the house? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, we've, we've now aged them up, but then we mad when police aged them up. But mm -hmm. it's like, you can't age them up either. Yeah. Police That's shouldn't true. be aging them up, but you shouldn't be aging them up either. Yeah. You know, your eight-year-old's not the man of the house. Yeah. Yeah. I want black boys to be able to be boys. Right. Have adventure, imagination, and all those things. Yeah. I was thinking about that when I was reading um, the chapter about you playing football. <laughs> so I, I resonated with that personally. I come from a very <laughs> athletic family. I am not athletic. I, like you, jump double dutch better than I play football. Period. <laughs> um, and one of the things I used to think about when you, um, related to your what you were just saying is, um, that makes me sad about boyhood, is we have such a narrow view of, of boyhood. We have, we have such a narrow view of boyhood and what boys can and cannot do and what they should be able um, to do. And uh, you referenced gymnastics and like, you know, I remember growing up loving the Olympics because I was like, there's so many sports. I grew up in Southeast DC and there was just football and basketball. Right. And I remember thinking maybe I would have been more athletic if I knew that there were other options. And I think that is true for so many of these boys who are physical and athletic. Maybe they just want to dance. They don't want to play football, you know? Right. And, and I wish we um, allow more people, <laughs> more, more boys to do that. Yeah. yeah, so I appreciate you yeah. making that point. Um, we are, I'm trying to make sure, uh, <laughs> we, I don't uh, take you all's time, I'm trying to get a few more of these in. Um, you were talking earlier about um, family yes. uh, and writing and, and people ask you how family's doing. Do you, I don't know if you read um, uh, Panama Jackson, I think and wrote um, in the root um, how how like Trump divided me from my white mother or something like that it was this great essay you all should I remember read it. it yeah and I love I, Panama I remember it yeah. yes and it, and now he writes for the Grill and he just put out a podcast a couple of weeks ago um, reflecting on that essay and what he would do differently because as you noted when you're telling your story and your family yeah. story you're telling their, their story as well. too yeah. Are you, do, is there anything looking back you go, I would do this differently if I knew that this was how it would be received? Um, <laughs> like specifically, specifically related, to family, related to family members. The only thing I would do differently is the chapter about my cousin Hope. Um, my cousin Hope, I grew up with a transgender cousin named Hope. Um, I would write it a little, well, 
I, like, there's been like some contention around that chapter about like the way that I described it and like my changing of pronouns of her throughout the chapter. But I also decided like when I wrote that chapter, I wrote it like I was a five year old who met this person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a memoir. And it's like in memoir writing, it's not about like correct language. Mm -hmm. It's about what was the language you were using at the time, right. you know? And so that was like the toughest decision. It was like, should I write about this or should I not write about this? Like, or should I write about like it, like from the place where I have the language? Cause I, know, I have the language, I know the yeah. terms, all this. Yeah. So it was like, I could have wrote, writ, written it from that place. But I was like, but if there's a trans kid or a person who hasn't decided to transition yet, they need to know what it looked like, what it felt like, what it looked like, how I felt, what I saw Hope the first time and yeah. all those things, right? Yeah. And so like I used Hope's, um, with the, what, what we now know is as a dead name. Yeah. But it's like when I met Hope in 1990, yeah. that wasn't that was a term, name? right? Like, yeah. like, like her dead name wasn't like dead name wasn't a, wasn't a right. thing. Right. And so like when, when I was writing it, I'm writing it as like, I'm the five year old who met this person and watch and like trying to write through the evolution of it i didn't have a whole lot of pushback against it like but there were definitely some people who were like i'm a little triggered by this but i understand why you did yeah. what you did but um i think that would be the one chapter that i may go back and be like mm -hmm. maybe i could rewrite it in some way but i'm also like i'm okay with critique yeah like yeah. i think I'm okay with that, right? Because like, you critique a lot of people every I day do. on Twitter. Yeah. So. I do. I drag. I carry. So I'm like, I'm okay with critique. Um, you know, Baldwin gets critiqued yes. all the time. Yes. Um, Tony Morrison really doesn't. But because <laughs> it's like, if anybody says anything about that lady, it's like, we, we going to drag you to the from here to the end, right? <laughs> like from the rooter to the tutor. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I had to, like, I, I've gone back and forth, like, should I change it? Should I leave it? But I, in many ways, I'm like, I want to leave it because I think I need to be critiqued 30 years from now. I need like the people 30 years from now to so be many, like, so many, you were wrong because yeah. this. And I and I can sit and be like, okay, I'll take it's it. It's going to be language in your book 30 years from now that they that well, they don't well, use anymore, anymore, right? Right. right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to get some of you all's questions. I, I obviously have more, but I know you all came to ask questions. And so how, how are we going to go about doing this? There's, is there a mic? Um, and Chanel's gonna, uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and Chanel will find you. And I would love to start with your name and, and where you're from. Hi. 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 I'm Donovan, I'm from Atlanta originally, but I just moved here like five weeks ago. So okay. I'm new Welcome. to the area. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I just want to ask, in terms of, I love the book, by the way. Thank you. But, so what we notice a trend here is where in the same places where your conversations about where your book is being banned, it's the same places where we see voting rights under attack. It's the same places where we see transgender legislation, LGBTQ legislation coming up. Yeah. So what do you think the end goal here is in terms of democracy and things of that nature? So, honestly, the the issue is that we or not we but like media whatever like they look at all these issues in a silo right mm -hmm. and so it's like oh they're banning books right oh roe v wade and they talk about them like they're two things that don't have anything in common when it's really like no like roe v wade is tied to the book bans mm -hmm. is tied to don't say gay is tied mm -hmm. to anti-trans, like they're all tied together. And so when I th think about like democracy and like where we're going, it's like realistically, the T is that there was a 2019 census done. They went through all of the generations and Gen Z popped up at 50.2% white. <laughs> right, popped up at 50.2%. Oh. I know, I know, can we cuss in the library, y'all? <laughs> Oh, uh, you're right, freedom of speech. Okay. 50.2% white and 49.8% non-white. And so a bunch of these MFs on the hill was like, oh shit. We thought that the population change wasn't gonna happen until 2050. Mm -hmm. 
However, we at 2019, <clears throat> and clearly we are already at the new generation yeah. at 50%. Yeah. Then that same, <coughs> excuse me, that same census said uh, we were almost like 15 to 25% queer. Yeah, yeah, <coughs> which was way higher than they expected. <coughs> which was way higher than they expected. Right, I'm joking, because I'm like, I'm gagging. Yeah, and, they, uh, and they're blaming books. So, way harder than expected. So it's like, all right, now we gotta have, white women gotta have more children. Mm-hmm. Because be clear, if it was only black women and brown women only having abortions, these white men would not care. Be very clear. We gotta stop white women from having abortions. They have to have more children, right? But then it's also like, oh, sh- the books are also mirroring yeah. what the new demographic looks like. So it's like, when we look at democracy, we're like, oh shit, like the books in the school systems are now telling the truth. Mm -hmm. I played Abraham Lincoln when I was in the third grade. I was the lead role in the play. (laughs) And I played Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I played Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln and that was the lead role. And I was excited (laughs) because he freed the slaves. And that's what they taught me. But now my little cousin go to school and she read books like mine Mm -hmm. that tell the truth about him. And so they are trying to like stop that, right? So it's like, where's democracy going? Where we're at is like, we're at a place where like the truth cannot be denied. That's yeah. why they're so upset about the 1619 project. Yeah. We want to do the 1776 project. I'm sorry, like the Mayflower, and it's interesting, right? Like, cause even we grew up, the Mayflower and slavery happened like at the same time. Right. So like they landed on Plymouth Rock. Right. And they also enslaved a bunch of people at the same time mm-hmm. and act like those two stories are separate. Right. Um, so where I think about like democracy, like where are we heading? It's like, one, we've never been a democracy. That's why we keep electing presidents who don't have the most votes. Um, <laughs> two, the math, the math is what it is. The math is not mathing. Yeah. Um, two, um, what are we, a democratic republic? Yeah. And we all have to accept that. Um, three, where are we going though? Um, I honestly don't know. Like, it's, it's a very interesting time. Um, we are watching, like, laws be enacted by the minority. Yeah. And that's, like, a rare thing in this country, like, where, like, the minority opinion at this point is, like, having, like, the biggest amount of, like, change in this country. Yeah. Um, but I also feel like Gen Z is about to, like, shake shit up. Yeah. And, you know, I always hear people complain, like, 18, they ain't voting enough, they ain't voting enough. And I'm like, but it's cause they tired. Like yeah. they looking at y'all yeah. like, well, my grandmother voted, my mother voted, great grandma voted, and look yeah. the fuck we got, we ain't got shit. Yeah. But I do feel like they about to shake this midterm up in a uh, way, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, they I about to turn so. it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think we're gonna end up seeing like, for the first time a midterm election that, uh, where the, the typical that happens at a midterm where it's like whoever's in power sure. Right. It shifts back. Yeah. I don't think it's going to shift back this yeah. time. And I think it's going to gag the girls. Yeah, no. I, mean, <laughs> I, I think Gen Z is a very active and vocal generation in terms of what it is that they care about and the America they want to see. And we're, we're seeing that in so many ways, and, and, and uh, including, you know, <coughs> lawmakers and ideas they get behind. Um, any, I, th- I thought I saw another question. Did anyone else have questions? <coughs> I'm like joking. Uh-huh. Um, you had mentioned, uh, What's your name and where are you from? I'm from <coughs> Jumping on water. Water. Um, <laughs> you had mentioned how powerful it was to now know that there are queer youth who have public figures that they can look up to. Um, and I wanted to know, were there public figures that you had who were queer or not that you looked up to? Um, and what you think the difference is now? Um, and what the danger is with folks trying to ban access to figures like that. That's a good one. Um, So I often joke about how like the queer figures I had to look up to were like, um, there was a gay guy on a show called Spin City. Okay. He was was a black gay guy. Um, He ended up marrying the white gay guy on Spin City. And I remember how like, how big that moment was. Um, also like the first time I learned about the term lesbian was from Murphy Brown. Mm-hmm. Cause I used to watch it with my mom. Yeah. And so like 
the night that like they brought it up, I was like, mommy, what's a lesbian? And she was like, well, you know what I mean? Your daddy, you know, in love with each yeah. other. I was like, yeah. And she was like, well, sometimes women are in love with women. And I was like, okay. And we went back to watching Murphy Brown. Um, there was also like an episode of Moesha, which was actually very homophobic uh, when we think about it. But basically like they outed a, uh, Hakeem's cousin and she read this poem called, I know what I know if you know what I mean. Wow. And I will never forget that moment because that also like kind of like made me like yeah. shut her back. Like, yeah. oh, like, is that what it's like in high school? Like when you find out that a person is gay and then like this person goes and tells other people and then all of that. Um, so we didn't have like a whole lot of like representation no. during those times. Um, but also like I'm working, I'm working on a book now where it's like, it's not that we didn't have the representation, it's just that we didn't know it existed. Yeah. So it's like our heroes were stolen from us. Yeah. So it was like, and I say that because it's like, I learned about Baldwin, I learned about Langston Hughes, I learned about all of them, but I learned about them outside of their queerness. Yeah. So what ended up happening is that like, you go through like K through 12 and you're like, well, damn, nobody's like me. Like, yeah. where are my people at, right? And then you learn that like, for instance, like with Martin Luther King, it's like, oh, well, Bayard Rustin right. was the architect of right. the March on Washington. Right. But then, as I'm doing even deeper research now, it's like you learn that during that speech that he gave at the March on, uh, the March on Washington, he mentions two philosophers that he thinks are the greatest philosophers of our time, one being W.E.B. Du Bois, but the other one being Elaine Locke. Mm -hmm. Elaine Locke is openly gay, was, a, yeah. was, a, was a gay man, like a, a publicly gay man. Yeah. But nobody at the time knew who Elaine was. But like even now, we're like 50, 60 years from the March on Washington, and the only one we talk about is W.E.B. We never talk about a right. right? And so it's like, that's what I'm trying to like, I guess, fight against now, right? And so it's like, I want us to have possibility models. Yeah. I want the youth to be able to see somebody like me, see somebody like Eugene, yeah. Keith Boykin, like right, wh right. whomever it is. Like, I want them to be able to see us living our lives fully in our transparency, in our vulnerability, and be like, wow, I can be that too, because we grew up not having yeah. that. Yeah, no, it's, it's so true. I mean, I, sometimes <laughs> when I talk to youth I mentor, I don't think they understand how big the pendulum sw swing was in such a very short amount of time. Yep. Like, I, I was thinking about your question, and I was like, I, I mean, I did not have any gay role models, which I'm sure is one of the many reasons in which I remain in the closet as long as I did, because I did not see what life could be. I mean, I grew up in DC in the 90s. I was afraid the AIDS epidemic was the main narrative in which, through I, that through which I learned about the gay experience. And um, yeah, there weren't like authors I could name or right. you know journalists or or. There was there was nothing close to Lil Nas X, <laughs> right? At, at all. But um, right. I'm so glad that's changing for so many people. Yes. Now. Are there more questions? I'm like, don't be afraid. Y'all can ask anything. Mm -hmm. It don't have to be about the book. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Kristen Jeffers, originally from Greensboro, North Carolina, but yes. I've been in the DMV now for six six years this week yes so i just want to first and foremost i want to thank y'all for being up here as a fellow mb in their 30s in the journalism space <laughs> you know people oftentimes i run into people who are like why do you tell people you know you don't look the part that's why i want to like thank y'all for having this conversation thank you for writing the book i got a book draft she'll tell you <laughs> i got a book draft right now i'm about to be up there and i love it and I'm, I'm also on stages and everything and just what do you say to like just in our black community because i grew up in the church like everybody that says or even people say why disclose why tell people why yeah. even say this even though we're in this permissive era now yeah 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 yeah, yeah. no that's a, that's an important thing i think sometimes people are incredibly naive about how many people are still not openly gay, however you even phrase, phrase that, it. yeah, right. and what openness means. But why, why, I mean, why do you feel like that's, this was important to share? I mean. Like I always say, like, um, 
I'm not the first person to have my story. I was just the first person to tell it. And so it's important for me to share it because it's like, well, if I can look back, you know, I look all the way back to slavery and it's like, we have all these slave narratives, not all these slave, we have some slave narratives, but a lot of them get really, really like interesting around queerness. And then you look at the Harlem Renaissance and it's like, you had some people who were publicly yeah. saying who they were, but then you had a lot of people who weren't, like who was still pretty, you know, I hate the term confident, but just yeah, not, I'll right. just say not pl- public right. about what, who they were. And you get the Stonewall and you got Marsha throwing bricks and you got, you know, the, the, the girls are tussling and fighting for our rights. Um, so then you have like this era of like rebirth, almost in a sense where like, oh, all these gay clubs open up and like mm-hmm. now we have like these spaces and safe spaces and you have the HIV epidemic, yeah. which kind of like shifts all of that back some, right? And so I'm just kind of like, you just you kind of get to a space where it's like you know we've watched time time period generation after generation after generation of like what they deem as progress but we also have watched like where people are still suppressed people are still yeah. dl dl which again right, like right. another term that I, I don't even like to use but it's like i understand it right? right but it's like as much progress as we've made we still are not able to fully be ourselves right um, and our community, unfortunately, has taken the same things that have oppressed us, and then we've taken it into our community and then started oppressing others within it. Right. And so the fact that we have fat phobia, and we still have colorism, and that we still have femme phobia, and we still have like all these things, even within our community, right. it's just like, well, we already was like pushed out of that, and then y'all took the same oppressive tools and then started oppressing people within yeah. our sh- stuff yeah. I'm trying not to curve we at the library um and so yeah like that that's that's how I'm like I guess like my thought process goes into like why I do what I do why I write what I write why um I think it's necessary that we continue to tell the story um because like our story has been suppressed for so long we haven't been able to be raw be vulnerable yeah. be our full transparent selves um and I just hope that like my story is opening the door for ac- the actual people who need to write their stories too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, me, I mean, I, I came out my, like really late comparatively to most people. I'm 41 years old. You were saying 30, so I was like, I wish. <laughs> uh, I actually came out at 37. Yeah, and so I just, I was, I was tired of lying, and I was tired of my lies hurting people I cared about. Um, and it was just, it was very consistent with what you were sharing. It was very important just to live a true, honest, authentic life. Um, and I was covering identity politics in right. the Trump era and like ev- everything was just so very personal and I just knew that um, to look at myself in the mirror and look at other people and just be about what I needed to be about, I was like, why am I, who, why do I care so much about what these people think who don't care don't that care much, much about, about me? me? I'm like, I'm too grown to be afraid of this. And I don't say that with any um, lack of sensitivity or compassion or understanding to people who are my age or older who do not feel comfortable with sharing the whole story. I was, I remember processing it with my therapist because I was like, my therapist was pushing me towards it and I didn't know. And <laughs> He said, um, one, I think you're going to get way more support than you think you are. But also, if you don't, I think you will be okay. You have the systems in place and relationships okay. and right. work and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, and, and he was right. But for me, it was about truth. And I don't say that to shame anyone who cannot share their that whole part of themselves right now but my hope is that at one point some point people can um be their uh full authentic self um and we were talking about this years ago you may not remember i uh i'm not going to pretend it's all been rainbows since coming out i remember we were like if we knew that some parts of living openly would be this difficult i don't know i don't know that i would have come out what yeah. i did or how i would have come out but overall it's just been the most amazing experience being free enough to be who you really yeah. are. Um, 
and uh, it's great to live in a time where that's possible, where books like this exist to help other people uh, live that truth as well. Are there more questions? I'm gonna take a question, a personal privilege um, yeah. here as, as the organizer. <laughs> uh, in my, I moved to Washington, D.C. to come out. My name is Ryan. And uh, in the midst of my coming out, uh, once I felt that, I always say the most important coming out is coming out to yourself. Yeah. The day after I came out to myself, I went to the library because I knew that growing up, libraries were safe spaces for me. And I was looking for a story about my coming out. I read stories about gay cowboys. I was not a cowboy, I'm from West Philly. <laughs> uh, I read stories about coming out in other parts of Europe where they were freer to be able to write about their experiences than they were here in the United States. My question is this for you both, uh, because to be a great journalist, to be a great writer means that you are also an active reader. Who were you reading in the midst of your own as you were finding yourself? Well, I'll say um, as a middle schooler and sneaking into you know, MLK Library to read, mm -hmm. I was reading um, uh, stories by uh, a fraternity brother of ours, Elin Harris. Yes. Um, who was writing about like I mean, I, I used to cover my book like it was a, a um, textbook with like the paper bag because <laughs> I, I, my, if my family knew what I was reading, we would have some problems. Um, and uh, that was without question um, something as a young kid that gave me some insight into what life maybe could be in like, I think like James Earl Hardy and like yeah. B-Boy Blues and, 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 and work like that. Um, I don't know how much I read currently about what it means to be gay. I don't read, a, I, I do not read a lot of fiction. Um, I love op-eds and essays. I mean, Same. my introduction to That's George me. was when George was writing for NBC Black. Yes. Right? Yep. Um, and <laughs> that so, Ryan set up. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> Look, that Ryan set up. Yeah, no. Yes, he told me earlier that's how, yes, that's how we connected. met. Yeah. Who are you reading? Who do you remember <laughs> reading about the black? Not even black, but the gay experience. Nobody. Nobody. And I'd be, and I'm very, <laughs> I say it publicly on TV, like I was forced to read about Holton Caulfield. <laughs> I'm so sick of him, catch her in his rye. <laughs> I was forced to read about Little Women and forced to read about, um, was it Dear God is Me? Okay. <laughs> I was forced to read that The Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams. Um, what was it? Uh, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Like that was on my yeah. reading list. Yeah. And I was telling them the other day, I was like, you know what? Like, they were like, what books inspired you? I was like, you know what? It was my hatred of the books I had to read that yeah. inspired me to write the yeah. books that I wanted, no. <laughs> you know? Um, but honestly, <laughs> I, I can't read I'm, I'm gonna say it. Um, a book that really like got me like into who I am today <laughs> was Confessions of a Video Vixen. Yeah. Um, like I remember when it came out. Um, I remember me and my I'm like, mother. What chapters did you leave on the cutting room floor? Like <laughs> none. Like I I remember when it came out. Like my mom had it, and I was sneaking read it. Mm -hmm. And I remember, cause like I was living in Jersey. And so like, you know, you live in Jersey that like Jersey, I live in central Jersey, let me be clear, not South Jersey. Um, I live in central Jersey. And so like, yeah, you know, you, you're in the New York media market yeah. if you're in central Jersey. Yeah. And so like, I remember when like, uh, Karen Stafford, Steffens did like the interview with Wendy Williams yeah. and like was talking about the book. And like me and my mom literally we sat in the car, like while she was on, like we would sit, like that was our thing. Like me yeah. and my mom's thing was like, if Wendy had a good interview going, we would get to the house and we would just be like, all right, come on, we go sit in the car. We would sit in the car and listen to a good Wendy interview. Um, but I remember that book because it was like, how trans, like this is so Man, transparent. Like this is so raw, so yeah. vulnerable, so like all those things. And so like, 
it's funny because like people are like, what's your inspiration for writing All Boys Are In Blue so raw and so vulnerable? I'm like, really, it's like Confessions of a Video Vixen because that lady told, yeah. spilled her tea. And I was like, well, she spilled the industry tea, but I was like, in was my book, course. I spilled my own tea, yeah. right? So like that actually was a book that like made me think about writing differently because it was like, at that point, like I don't think anybody had been it's so like just like, I'm gonna lay it out. Yeah, and yeah. so like with all boys aren't blue, which is again why they're attacking it. It's like I'm gonna just make it plain. Like yeah. I was black, I was queer, and y'all treated me like shit. Mm -hmm. And now y'all go ahead to deal with it because I'm writing about y'all. Was there was there any part <laughs> of your story that you were like afraid to share? Absolutely. Like, yeah. honey, like talk about bottoming for the first time, yeah. girl. Like, yeah. And I mean, I was like, I laid it out. I was like, all right, I'm gonna lay it out. <laughs> Cause again, it's like it's easy to talk about topic for the first time. The girls are like, oh, <laughs> well, so you know, and like the girls is like, oh, you're verse. Like, and even like today, they're like, bitch, I read your book. I didn't know you was verse. I thought you was a, you know. So it's like you spill your tea. Look, right? I'm serious. Like they were like, girl, we didn't know you was verse. Like, bitch, we always thought you was a bottom. I'm like, well, girl, now the tea is in the book, right? Like, I I do both, you know. Every now and then I feel athletic, but it's like, <laughs> you know. So it's like. That was like no shit. Yeah. I, I'm being, I'm not being physician. I'm actually being the truth. Yeah. But it's like that chapter was really, really tough to write because it was yeah. like, ooh, like, because I learned so much, like even from those two experiences, yeah. and especially the second experience, yeah. like about like consent and like yeah. saying no and like all of that type of stuff. Because like you, you just didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. Like because nobody gave us any education on how it was supposed to feel, like what it was supposed to be, yeah. and so it's like you just harming yourself. Um, and then also writing about like the, a different ball game. The, 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 you know, like the sexual assaults that yeah. I, I experienced like as a, t as a teenager, like one from my cousin, one from like a, a classmate in school, um, which is, it, which even that's interesting because like, I still know that person's name. And I'm like, as we're planning our, uh, I graduated from Bishop Bar in 2003. So like, as we're planning our 20 year reunion, it's like, is this person going to show up? Yeah. And if this person show up, what am I going to say? Like, how am I going to feel, right? Like, because I never let that moment go. Yeah. And um, those parts are very, very hard to write about. And it's always interesting because I'm like, I want, like, I know, like, some of my classmates from uh, high school have read the book. And I'm like, yeah. I wonder if he read that part and knew it was him. Yeah. Right. So like it's hard to write about that type of stuff, but I also know it's necessary to write about that type of stuff because I'm a possibility model mm -hmm. and I need for these teens specifically who are reading this to know like, whoa, wait, I went through this. I didn't know that was right. that I was being groomed. Yeah. I didn't know that I was being this or this that that this yeah. thing is that's what they're doing. Like they do like little feelers, right? Like with the grooming thing, it's like the first thing they do is like they show you a picture. The second yeah. thing they do is this. Then they rub your, your knee and it, and then they go to the next step, right? It's like it's yeah. it's usually never just like a a thing that just happens in this one moment, right? right? They're they're testing you to see how far they can go. And like that's what the book gave. And so um so yeah, like yeah. those are the tough parts to write. Like one thing I'm I'm um you know, when, when I when I sh share have shared like some of the harder parts of my own story with people and, and friends and, you know, family or therapy, one thing I'm blown away by is how unoriginal our stories are, right? You have this part, this experience you went through that you haven't shared with anyone, that you're afraid that you're the only person who experienced it. And you're like, no, this is unfortunately way more common than, um, than you realize. Yep. But when you put it in, a book, something like this, people do understand that, hey, wow, this is not, I'm not the only person experiencing this. Yeah. Um, we have like five more minutes. Are there more questions? No, yes. so one here and one there. Hello, how are you doing? Um, I came in a little late, but <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I got caught the, the moment that I have. Um, and I, I just want to say that, you know, we're, we're all one nation under God, and I had even learned that even though we have some differences, there are some similarities in, in, in some of our characters. But what I wanted to know, as opposed to what man, the laws that has passed for gay rights, and as opposed to what God's law, how have you dealt with that? And how, how did your families treat, treat you as you came out? Because I was wondering, you know, like, I am a believer in the God, man above, and I, mm -hmm. I am believing in his word. How do you deal with that as you live your everyday life, you knowing that God is saying this, 
But if you are born of that which he is opposed to, what are you supposed to do? Because some doctors say it's hormonal. Some people say it comes from being pampered too much because there's so many varieties that makes a person the way they are, even for heterosexual. So how do you deal with that opposed to man's law and what God's law said, which we're supposed to live by, abide by, and die by, as opposed to uh, you know what Congress is passing, what your families are saying? It's a real question. If, if it's not too deep in your left. Do you want to go? You wanna I'll go? take it. I'll, I'll, we'll both go, but go ahead. Yeah, sure. Sure. You want to go? Uh, um, how do you fail? <laughs> well, I mean, the short answer, well, I'll give you two answers, and I'm, I'm agnostic, so I don't deal with God's law. Um, and quite frankly, I didn't realize until after the fact that my struggle to come out was really a war regarding me and my faith, and whether or not I, was I going to live as an openly gay man, or was I going to hold a interpretation of the Bible that does not affirm gayness. And what I realized was that my truth was that I was gay and therefore I could not uh, hold to a faith that taught that who I was was bound for eternal hell. And so, um, I mean, my story, and I'm not very public about this, quite frankly. I tell people it was easier to come out gay than it is agnostic. Um, and like my, I mean, if I, there are people in my immediate family, if they hear this recording, that will be surprised. But um, what, what, I, what I realized ultimately was that um, what, I, what, I, what I was certain of, because that's what we're talking about, we're talking about agnosticism, what I was certain of was that I was gay. And that um, suppressing that would be suppressing my truth. I was less certain. Um, increasingly of the faith that I was raised in, that it was true. But one thing I will say, one, my biggest fear about coming out, quite frankly, because I come from a very religious family. My, my little brother's a pastor. I'm named after a pastor. Um, and I remember the day I told my mom, I was very defensive. I was prepared for her to reject me because in, when I, and she'd be sad about this part, but when I was in high school, she, she had not created a gay affirming environment. I, I did not feel safe to come out as a younger person. And I was afraid she would reject me because she is a very religious person. And my mom, what really moved my mom to affirm me was um, learning about um, how a large percentage of homeless youth are actually queer teens. And mm -hmm. that they're queer teens in part because they've been put out by their religious families, family members. And... Um, uh, my mom said, well, I, I'm not going to pretend to know the whole Bible, but what I do know is that God does not want me putting my kid out because they're gay. It was that simple for her. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was fascinating because I think a lot of gay people and, and the, a lot of the, a lot of the um, Christians that I knew who were struggling with their sexuality tried to um, really just parse the scriptures and mm -hmm. try to see, well, what did this really mean in the Greek and the Hebrew and all that? And my mom was like, it's simple. God, like, I, there's no way God wants you kicking out your kids. And it was, the, it was that simple for her. And so that was how she processed it. Like, she, for her, the loving, godly, Christian thing to do is to raise, to love the son that she believes God give, gave her. For me, um, it's just not something I wrestle with anymore. I, um, I know I'm gay, and that's what I know for sure. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. True. I mean, I guess for me, I'll, I'll be real quick with this one. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, the the whole like notion of like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm being led by the Bible, and it's like, okay, so you really believe that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, you know, was sitting there in the fire, and like somebody pulled them out of some fire, and they survived this fire, right? And it's like, you believe that Jonah was yeah. really swallowed by by yeah. a fucking whale? Yeah. Like, and yeah. survived it. Like, you have you ever seen a whale? Yeah. Have you yeah. ever seen a whale eat? Yeah. You think that somebody actually, like, came out of, like, the whale ate him and, like, he came out of that? Yeah. So, like, I always find it interesting when people are like, that's the law they live by. Because I'm like, realistically, and people could get, you know, mad sag or be in a bag about it. But it's like, the Bible is a book of, like, fables. Like, it's like Aesop. It's fables, right? These are fables. These are stories that are giving you principles. Like, just, like, principles that you can, like, 
extrapolate from mm -hmm. to like figure out how you want to live your life. They have turned these principles that we are extrapolating from this book into like, these are laws that we have to live by. And yeah. to me, that's BS, right? Because it's like one, there's a reason that like the Bible we read has a bunch of chapters that aren't in it. Cause let's be clear. There's several books that they removed from it. The version that most of, most people accept, even in most black churches, is yeah. the King James version. Right. Well, King James won't black. Yeah. Yeah. So like the version that we're even taking like from this person isn't isn't that right? The parts about homophobia or like um, gayness, queerness in the Bible, they were about pedophilia originally. It was changed many years later when they did a different version of the Bible to it being gay people are a sin or like being gay is an abomination. That's not what the original text said. The original text was talking about pedophilia was a sin. Somebody in the 1700s decided to say, you know what, it's not pedophilia, it's being gay is a sin. But if you look at what it coincided with, it coincided with the fact that the United Kingdom um, had this whole uh, attack against queerness. Because in Africa, queerness was celebrated. There, that's why there are still African deities who we would now say, oh, that's a transgender deity. Back then they didn't have those terms, but now when you look at some of those deities, they're actually trans deities. Mm -hmm. So when I hear people talk about like the Bible in this way of like, that's the, the law we have to live by, that's not a law that I need to live by. Like, right. And the other thing is like, my grandmother went to Mount Pisgah. My great grandmother Lula Mae was a Mount Pisgah girl. Nanny was a Mount Zion girl, mother of the church. Like, there's nothing that you could tell me about my salvation when I came from a person like that who fully supports me. I mm -hmm. could be, I could be so less concerned about what the preacher got to say out of his mouth mm -hmm. when my grandmother is the God-fearing woman that ran my house and runs my life and is my ancestor that runs my day to day. Mm -hmm. She was a God-fearing woman. My mother is a God-fearing woman. They pray, to, even though I don't pray to that same God, they yeah. pray to that God for me. And so I respect that God because they pray to that God for me. But what you're not going to do is tell me that I could, I'm going to be condemned by the same God that these people prayed to, right? And that my ancestors prayed to, right? Because it's like, I made a joke literally today because somebody came at me about being gay. And they were like, you're going to literally just like before this whole thing started, they were like, you're going to have to answer to God one day. I said the same God that was sleep during slavery crickets delete the tweet right because like you can't tell me that this god allowed us to go through this punishment for all these years and that 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 this that then all of a sudden that that becomes the law that we have to live by yeah. like i understand praying to a, a force in a being that we don't know and that we don't see i respect it yeah. but at the same time i'm not going to be beholden to it when i've watched the punishment of my people under that same person who we claim to be our powerful being yeah, no, I mean, it's really interesting <laughs> because so much of the spirit behind the, the move to have your book banned in certain places is due to an idea about what is good and true and righteous, righteous and pure. And, pure. Um, and for many of the people who are not supportive of your work, it's based on their understanding of, of their faith. Absolutely. And there's no room for your kind of work within... Um, what they would consider a Christian nation, yeah. and so it's 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 a very it's been very interesting seeing um, people uh, re to, uh, respond to you know these books as it being like a righteous war, right? Yeah, um, yeah. No, it's been um, I, I uh, it's been a really fascinating time I think in our culture as a whole where people are revisiting what. Uh, righteousness and what is good and what is just looks like. Yep. Um, and you were talking about Gen Z earlier, yes. and uh, you all may have seen the Pew Research poll that came out last week. Uh, the number of, no surprise, the number of people who are identifying as religiously unaffiliated. Everyone keeps talking about Gen Z. It's going up in it's literally going up every, in every demographic. demographic. Like they're more silent generation people who are saying, I will no longer look to, to the church. This, this church, yep. this, um, as being the uh, you know authority on all things that yeah. are, are right, and 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 the political climate is part of why that has been the case. Yes, 
but um, I'm so glad we had this time with you tonight. Um, <laughs> can we please give our author a, a round of applause? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, I know we have uh, books that are signed, but I want to turn this part over to who? <laughs> Ryan? <laughs> Give a hand to Eugene and George. <laughs> so, a uh, Band Book Week continues tomorrow. There'll be a panel um, tomorrow um, that's more around uh, what you all can do as everyday citizens uh, uh, to encourage. Uh, or discourage book banning, uh, we should say. Also, we have Art All Night. Um, that will begin at 8 p.m. Uh, Art All Night is at the celebration of the arts, including the literary arts here throughout the city. We invite uh, you all um, out to our digital commons tomorrow. We'll, we will have a number of activations. You've probably seen them going up as you are, have been coming in. Uh, we are turning this great hall here into Harpo's Juke Joint to celebrate um, all things Alice Walker and The Color Purple, among many other books um, that have been banned um, throughout this country. Uh, out on the street, we will have a number of acts, including, uh, I'm, I'm flying by the seat of my pants here, Black Alley is closing out. Uh, Subtle Thoughts, DJ Rico um, here. So if you are in town or enjoying Art All Night in your own respective neighborhoods, come down to MOK. Thank you and have a good night. The library is closed. <laughs>